The drama continues in Lakerland. The play-in is set to begin, and the NBA playoffs are just around the corner. This is Locked on NBA. You are Locked on NBA, your daily NBA podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On NBA, your daily source for all things NBA from the Locked On universe. Thanks for joining us. We hope that you're making this your first listen each and every day. We're free and we're available on all platforms, including YouTube, where you can watch a live stream of the show and see our shining faces and my facial expressions as we talk Lakers today and my extreme disappointment with everything about that franchise. Today's episode is brought to you by Price Picks. Check out PricePicks.com and use promo code NBA. Or go to your app store and download the app today. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. My name is Matt Moore. I'm the senior NBA writer for the Action Network and the co-host of Locked On Nuggets. His name is David Ramil. You can find him on Twitter at DRamil13. He's co-host of Locked On Heat. David, the regular season is over. Yeah, not a second too soon, right? Uh, it seems like the last <laughs> month or so, I know there's been importance there, seeding games and whatnot, teams getting eliminated, teams already looking ahead to vacation status and things of that sort. But uh, it's also been, for teams that have been in the playoff picture for quite some time, like the teams that we cover, it's been somewhat of a drag, uh, whether or not you're you know counting on what your, your final seeding is and things of that sort. But now the games take a, an added significance. I don't need to specify that. But at the same time, it's just, you, you, there's a little buzz, right? It's almost like the, the, the beginning of an opening series or the, the beginning of opening this, the opening day on the season. You just kind of feel a little bit more excitement. I'm ready. I am excited to talk about playoff and even play in tournament basketball. The gap of how great play-in and playoff basketball is in the regular season is wide, which I think is why you know we've got all these conversations about moving the games back to 72 from Steve Kerr and whatnot. Mm. One team that would probably like to have had the season shortened even more this season is the Los Angeles Lakers, who held their season-ending media availability today. So here's 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 what we got. Uh, the Lakers season ends last night in a win in Denver over the Denver Nuggets B's team. Uh, no Westbrook, no. LeBron, no Anthony Davis, no Jokic, no starters really for the Nuggets. Um, and after that game, a nice feel-good win to go out on. And as that game ends, as the buzzer sounds, Adrian Wojnarowski of ESPN reports, Frank Vogel will not return as Los Angeles Lakers coach immediately. Just right, right as the buzzer sounds. Before Vogel gets into the media room, that report is issued. Vogel said after the game... I haven't heard S word uh, yep. about that report. And today it was made official. Vogel is out as head coach. Of this the is Los twice that's happened. I was in Orlando during the last game of the season. And I, I saw, I saw Frank's car pull out of the player staff garage of the Amway center. Uh, the night he got fired, like the last game of the season. And again, another dreary magic season of many dreary magic seasons and he was fired and, and just had to like leave past a throng of fans that weren't aware because they weren't on twitter because they're not plugged in and things of that sort and so they hadn't seen that he'd already just been fired and it's like it was just like a a painful moment to see him still signing autographs and waving and it was like his kids were in the car they were young girls oh, at man. the time it's just like this is the brutal aspect i've always liked frank i think he's a he's a fine coach not to say that he was perfect but what coach is? I haven't watched all 82 games of this dreary Lakers season. I'm sure he's made mistakes, but that is not his fault. This was not his fault. He was, should not have taken the blame for what was a terrible assemblage of talent uh, and, and a piss poor showing from the Lakers players that were available this season. So none of that should be uh, on him. I, I don't really, I don't understand what the purpose is. Like, what coach is going to come in there and inject energy and say, "Sorry, Russell." You can't continue to do what you've done for the past 15 years, despite the fact that you're no longer the player you once were. Who is going to be able to do something different with this roster than what Frank Vogel did? Yeah, there was some discussion last night on the Lakers postgame show of like, well, you know, this report didn't have to come out. Now. No, the, the thing is not on the reporter. The thing is on the is, right. it, you leak this. And right. all you had to say was, hey, we're going to fire him. Let's wait till Monday. Don't right. don't say anything. Till, all you got to do is do that. And Adrian Wojnarowski is like, no problem. 8 a.m., yep. that, that tweet comes out, and no problem. Uh, so that that's definitely on on the Lakers' side of this. I agree that, look, in my opinion, Frank Vogel is a great coach. 
He's had success in Indiana. The the Magic teams honestly overperformed a little bit to their expectations. They just weren't good enough. And right. then they won a championship with him. He, he won a championship with this coach. And what doomed Frank Vogel, when you look at this entire picture and you read the tea leaves, it was not Frank Vogel's coaching. It was the politics behind Clutch and all of the – he played DeAndre Jordan. They play, He played DeAndre Jordan because Anthony Davis got DeAndre Jordan brought there because they're friends. That's why he played out DeAndre Jordan. Like, you, you think you think Frank Vogel was like, DeAndre Jordan gives us a better chance to win than Marcus Gasol? You think that's what... what Is that Doc Rivers? Frank Vogel's history? You think that's what it says? You're right. So, uh, it, it's a ridiculous situation. And now we're... We'll get to Russ in a sec. Now word comes that the Lakers want to target Nick Nurse. Nick Nurse, Good luck. because if you're Nick Nurse and you're basically a god king in Toronto, what you really want to do is leave and go join the Lakers. I guess that's the idea. Thoughts on that? I mean, it's a great hire, uh, but at the same time, I just can't see your unless they're unless they're getting Nick Nurse in some kind of band or they're having him sell out to like a stadium or something like that there where he can play live. I just I don't see where it's a, a, any kind of appeal whatsoever. Like I, I guess it's a challenge. Like this is the whole thing. Like it, you and I and maybe most fans in general probably don't understand the mindset of what it's like to want to take on that kind of challenge, especially when you've got such a good thing going. At least I don't personally. So I mean, for to your point. He's like established there, loves that roster, took him to a championship. He's done everything he possibly could at, at the pit to reach the pinnacle of success in Toronto. But somehow maybe there's the new wrinkle there and you can say, oh, I want to try something different. I, I want to take this team that was so bad last year. It's Los Angeles. I like the star appeal. I want to be able to coach notable head cases on this roster and see if I can get the best out of them. Maybe. But I'd say that there's less than a 5% chance of him actually entertaining any offer from there. He's also under contract. That's something else to consider. <laughs> well, sure. I mean, we'll see there's how, that. how that goes. Russell Westbrook, meanwhile, basically vented to the media today saying that top to bottom, he was never given a real chance in L.A. Oh. That he wasn't allowed to do the things that make him good at basketball. He sure. said you have to talk to Frank Vogel about their relationship. Um, he, I mean, it was just – I'll say this. Um Well, here's one. Uh, Dan Wykey of, of the LA Times you know, mentions LeBron and AD said many times throughout the year, let Russ be Russ. Russell Westbrook immediately responds, yeah, but that wasn't true. Let's be honest. Um, he says he's not sure what Frank Vogel's issue is with him. He wasn't given a fair chance to be who he needed to be to help the team. Mm. Quite honestly, I, I here's the thing. I don't think he's wrong in terms of it was always set up that he was going to be the guy that took the fall. Like we knew this coming in, mm -hmm. right? We knew that if it failed, it was going to be Russ's fault. My problem though, is just, you have to take some responsibility for your play. Right? Like I'm a Russ guy. Yeah. But he played badly. He can't make layups. He turned the ball over. At some point you're responsible for not adapting your play style. Right? I, I agree. I, I hate that this whole season has turned me into like, an anti Westbrook type character that I yeah. play because I, I want to be able to watch it. Like there's nothing like Russell Westbrook in the NBA, even at this stage of his career, like the ferocity, which, which he attacks every possession is unparalleled. And, and it's like, that's a joy to watch as a reporter or somebody that covers basketball as a fan of the game. And yet this whole season has been a referendum on me, not wanting to like his style of play because it just hasn't aged as gracefully. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. There is responsibility on his part to to change the way he does, to be able to fit into this roster, to understand his role there. And it's partly that unwillingness to do so that's made him such an incredible, incredibly magnetic personality in today's NBA. And yet it's also made him not a great player in today's NBA. So he has to be able to understand something that so many people have had a hard time understanding over the course of this league is that when it comes to aging, you have to be able to change. You have to be able to fit your game to where you are if you want to continue to be a productive role player, which is what the best case scenario for Westbrook can be. That's very well said. I just, I'm not even going to follow up because like I echo everything that you just said there. Uh, very on point. Um, finally, the Los, not Los Angeles, Sacramento Kings, mm. not the hockey team, Sacramento Kings. Re okay, so relieved Alvin Gentry of coaching duties, but they're expected to come to an agreement with him on a front office position 
uh, per Adrian Wojnarowski of ESPN. So, yeah, uh, look, Alvin has been kind of making this noise for a while that he's just yeah. – he's looked done coaching. Alvin's been through the ringer. He's a lifer. He's been in doing this forever, right? Yep. And it's just probably time for like – he said last night that he was pretty tired of, of everything. So – I, I just think it was time for him to probably move to a front office role that's easier. Coaching is hard. It's stressful and it's exhausting with the travel. So yeah. probably time for him to move on. And and I think a front office role is good. It seems like the players really like him. It seems like there's a connection. I know that there's a lot of players around the league that respect him. So he's probably going to be helpful in terms of attracting talent to the Kings to whatever degree that you can. But look, my question for you is just straight up. Is there any scenario you could see where the Kings next head coach is successful? I, I I don't know how to break this cycle of failure for them. Yeah, I, I felt like they were, at least internally, they believed that they were getting, uh, taking a step in the right direction by acquiring Demonis Sabonis and, and trading Tyrese Halliburton. It just, on the outside, it didn't feel that way. It didn't seem that way. Uh, so I, I, you know, maybe adding Gentry as a, a different voice in that front office, just somebody to be the tenth man and say, you know what, I don't, I don't agree with these decisions. Maybe. Uh, that will change the culture there to some degree. Uh, and maybe between that and the pairing of a new coach, you can kind of get online. And you have to create – my, 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 my former life in PR taught me that you have to have a consistency of a message from top to bottom. And that's something the Kings don't have. They've got one player or one person in the front office who says A, the other one who says Z. You've got eight guys in between that say B through you know W. And it's like you have to have one consistent message – or else you're never going to be able to build what everybody now wants to call under the umbrella of culture. And that's been the problem. So I just, to your point, no, probably not immediately, but you can at least start taking baby steps in the right direction. In three years, maybe you can have a really good team built. And, and you know, at least it would be an improvement if you're not dysfunctional, so obviously dysfunctional, where everybody goes, what the hell are you doing? Which is what we did so many times on so many episodes of this show this past season. A lot of good assistants. Hope they go the assistant route. Don't bring back a retread. Like, yeah. don't. And especially, like, there's been talk of, like, oh, hey, Frank Vogel. No, Frank, <laughs> don't do that. Do, nope. Don't do, Someone, no if you're listening to this and you know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows Frank Vogel, please pass <laughs> along word that Matt Moore is asking him, please, God, do not take the King's job. I like Frank Vogel. I want better for him. Do not do that. Go do TV, Frank. I want better for you. Uh, all right, let's take a break. We'll come back and we'll talk about the play-in tournament, which begins as you're listening to this tonight. We'll break it down those games uh, and we'll talk a little bit more later on about the playoff series, what we think is going to happen there as well when we come back. But first, I need to tell you about Prize Picks, which is Daily Fantasy Made Easy. It's a great new app and we know that you're going to love it. So it's easy to use, right? You pick two to five players and over under on their projections and you can win up to 10 times on any entry and it's just you versus the projected numbers. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. It's safe. They offer fast withdrawals and you get to use the award-winning app on both the App Store and Google Play. Give you two right now. Uh, so the Cavs play pick and roll coverage at the level, which means they pressure the ball handler, which is why Kyrie Irving is going to rack up assists because they're going to get the ball out of his hands. He had nine assists in the game on Friday versus the Cleveland Cavaliers. So I'm going to take the over on Kyrie assists and the over on Bruce Brown points, because guess what? He's the role man. So he's going to be able to produce that way. Price picks does offer a variety of options. You got steals, points scored, rebounds, all the things that are tracking the box score. You can include in your price picks entries. They allow mixed sport entries. So you can throw in some NHL if you want. And price picks doesn't just offer NBA. They got options on college basketball, college football, NFL, the MLB season, which has just started soccer, MMA, and more. And for a limited time, Prize Picks has an exclusive no brainer of an offer for all of our users. You get $50 for free if a player in your first Prize Picks entry scores a single point, but you have to use code NBA. That's code NBA, exclusive offer for our locked on fans. Sign up using NBA and you get $50 for free if your player in your first Prize Picks entry scores a single point. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy we're also brought to you by bet online your number one source for all your betting spats and betting stats and sports info uh, i like the clippers tomorrow night quite a bit they're plus 130 on the money line you can find at bet online and that's a gr i think that's great value uh for the clippers in this matchup versus the timberwolves find all the latest sp sports developments league reviews and news including this year's basketball playoffs and the start of major league baseball season Be bet online's your continued source for all your sports wagering information from live betting to playoffs esports and more head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action bet online 
where the game starts. We'll be right back on Locked on NBA. Back here on Locked on NBA, Matt Moore and David Ramil here to talk with you about the play-in tournament. I want to thank you for making this your first listen every day. Now make your second listen Locked On Now. It's got nightly recaps of all the NBA games from our local experts. Check it out wherever you get podcasts. That's Locked On Now. All right, David, let's start in the Eastern Conference on Tuesday night. Exciting, the uh, Cleveland Cavaliers, yet again, playing the Brooklyn Nets after they played them last Friday. I feel that these teams have played quite a bit lately. Uh, the Nets are big favorites in this matchup. It's obviously... Uh, the winner of this will get the seven seed. They'll play the Boston Celtics in the first round. Nets are big favorites to be expected here. Cavs has had such an like a really inspiring, great season, but they're running out of steam. There was a report from Cleveland.com that there's pessimism that Jared Allen is going to be available to play in this one. Do you see any way that the Cavaliers are going to be able to find a way to upset the Brooklyn Nets and Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant? No, I do not. Uh, I actually. <laughs> I don't, I don't, <laughs> pretty quickly. Uh, look, I, I think uh, I just saw a tweet also from Shams Rania that uh, Jared Allen is listed as out for tomorrow or tonight's play in game. So I think I'm not sure if that's the case going to be or not. But uh, my feeling is that, look, they've just, they've surpassed expectations for this season. And between the, the constant punching of the gut to the, the injury to Mobley, the injury to Allen before that, losing players here and there over the course of the season, it's just, it's very tough for this roster to kind of keep it together. And they've gotten superb play from Garland, Kevin Love, et cetera. I just feel that they've, they've already surpassed their expectations for their season. And while they, I'm sure they'd like to continue to build on that success, it's hard to do. And especially when you've got a team like Brooklyn, who is absolutely desperate for something to to you know kind of hang their hat on after they traded James Harden, after they put this roster together last season with the expectation, or two seasons ago, with the expectation of winning a title and falling short in year three. I mean, they've got to do something. I just don't see any possibility of Cleveland knocking off Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving in a game. I just don't see it. Yeah, I mean, look, I, the playing game, the whole reason the players are scared of it is the, like the one game outcome, but the part of that has to be considered its shot variance. Yeah. Uh, is shot variance going to go the way of the Cavs? Like, who are their <laughs> shooters at this point? It's Laurie Markinen, Chetty Osman, Kevin Love, and Darius Garland having to do everything. But Darius right. Garland's going to have to have the greatest game in the history of the play in tournament. Uh, uh, but a great game nonetheless. Uh, by any standard in order for them to have a shot in this game. And look, he's gotten points and he's scored and he's had great games. He was good in that game on Friday night. It didn't matter. Uh, they just don't have the weapons. Like the right. net, I don't even think of that great of a team as you would expect from an eight seed. It's just, if the Cavs had Jared Allen, I do think this kind of changes things because that ramps up their ability to yes. switch and play all the defense and they can put more pressure and they can protect the rim and really stay attached on the three point shooters. But without, Allen, there's just enough breakdowns on the perimeter, which allow forces the Cavs to help in, and then you get those perimeter shots on the outside. You throw in just the fact that KD can go for 40 easy, easy, because nobody can stop him even if they play great defense. Right. Kyrie right. didn't shoot well on Friday night. The Nets still won that game. Like That would be kind of the model here, right, is you think like, oh, well, if you can slow down Kyrie, and even if KD goes off, maybe you got a chance. That happened. Kyrie had a really inefficient night in that game on Friday. It just didn't matter. So I, I think we're probably getting Nets Celtics, which will be a fascinating first round wow. series given everything there is with that Kyrie Irving versus his old team again. And yeah. you know, the, the 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 Celtics got that big win a couple of weeks ago, but it took Tatum going absolutely nuclear. There's just a there's a lot in that matchup between uh, Brooklyn and Boston if we see it. The other matchup, very interesting. Minnesota Timberwolves taking on. The Los Angeles Clippers. Uh, Wolves are favored in this one. They're home. They're three point favorites in, in this matchup. Uh, my big question for this is the Wolves' defensive scheme tries to apply pressure on the ball handler. They do the same thing Cleveland does, where they play at the level and they want to skirmish and they want to force turnovers. Clippers are 10th best in limiting turnovers this season. On paper, this is a pretty poor matchup for the Clippers, and it kind of shows in the fact that the Clippers handily won the season series. Uh, what do you think about this matchup and what do you think is going to be the biggest edge that decides it? Uh, that That's tough. I, I, I really, I just, I don't know exactly what the, the biggest X factor is going to be. Uh, I, I just feel like 
you're looking at this Clippers roster, and, and I just I like their chance. I think Reggie Jackson's going to have a big game. I think he's going to be uh, the player that can help swing that, that this in, in the Clippers' favor. Uh, yeah, that, you're putting me on a spot here. I, I know I probably should have had something a little bit prepared going into okay. this, but I just I I really don't know exactly what's going to swing it in, in uh, Minnesota's favor. I'm, I'm trying to think of it from both sides of it. Uh, a monster game from Cat is the only thing that they, I think that could save Minnesota's chances. Other than that, I just think that the LA is is too experienced, too well coached, and, and just better equipped for the challenge of a play in tournament. One game in order to be able to save their season. We saw this from la- them last season too, where even in the playoffs where they were down Kawhi, etc., they were just able to continue to find a way to win. And I think that's the, the, the likely scenario here is that they'll pro- find a way to beat the Minnesota Timberwolves. This is a great coaching matchup. Ty Lue versus Chris Finch. Like these are two really good coaches. And yeah. I mean, everyone's going to give Lou the edge understandably and, and rightfully yeah. so because of his experience. Finch is a really good X's and O's coach. Like he's a really good X's and O's coach. So I'll be interested to see what he does in this matchup. Uh, a lot of this, honestly, if you're, if you're wondering like, what does a Wolves win look like? Uh, the Clippers are feast or famine. So their offense actually isn't that great. Like they just, they don't shoot all that well. Paul George helps that a lot. Mm-hmm. but they are very feast or famine. And so if they have a night where the threes aren't falling, that hurts them. They shoot in volume. And so if you're shooting a low percentage, even with the added efficiency of them in three pointers, that helps, but it won't necessarily be that much. The Wolves offense has been on an absolute tear. They've been a top five offense since all-star cat. I looked this up today. So the Clippers run a lot of switch. That's what they want to do is they want to, they want to switch everything. They like those matchups for them. Uh, cat, beasts versus Avisa Zubac head up. Uh, he generates a lot of points and he shoots pretty efficiently, not like 70% or anything. He's at like 55% effective field goal percentage, which is it's good enough. It's 56, I think actually, but he does score. He scores 40 points per hundred matchups versus Zubac. Zubac just can't really handle him. And so a lot of this is going to be, you know, D'Angelo Russell was questionable. He's going to play, but he's got an illness, a non COVID illness. So that's going to be, I think, a big question mark here. Uh, Anthony Edwards is going to have to have, like, the game. Like, yeah. it's going to have to be a, a massive Anthony on both ends of the floor. He's going to have to guard Paul George. He's going to have to score on his own. The Wolves are going to have to find ways to create turnovers that are non-traditional because the Clippers just honestly don't run pick and roll that much. Like, that's not how they generate most of their offense. So I think this is a tough matchup. I like the Clippers here, but I am excited yeah. to see what Cat does. This Wolves team has been plucky and resilient and tough all season long. Should be a really fun game. You put George on Ed- Edwards, or do you put Powell on him if he's available to play? Uh, I put Powell, and I let PG play safety. That's what I would do. Is I would have him roam, depending on what it is, and I would probably put because Delo is, isn't big enough to, ne- to necessitate like top end. You can probably right. get away with with whatever, and if you need to, you switch it up and you put Powell on on Russell, and then you put PG on on Edwards, if that, if things, if things are tighter than you'd like in the fourth, I think that's probably yeah. what you do, but they're going to switch everything anyway. So yeah, like that's, point. that's a real key is they're just going to flip, 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 flip. Uh, let's take a break. We'll come back and we'll talk about what our first thoughts are for these playoff series. I haven't firmed up any of my thoughts yet. We'll t- touch on what these series look like. Uh, I will especially want to get David's thoughts on some not, not great news about Bam out bio. We'll talk about that and a little bit more. When we come back on Locked On NBA, but first I got to tell you about Rock Auto. It's the best way for you to shop for auto parts for your car or truck. If you go to one of these big box stores, you're going to go in and they're going to ask you a bunch of questions and you're going to have to sit there and they're not going to have the part. And they're going to say, I can order it from this other one and have it driven over here. Can you come back in two hours? And you come back in two hours. Oh, I'm sorry. That guy went to lunch. Can you come back tomorrow? Don't waste your time. Don't do that. Just go to rockauto.com. They're going to have the same parts for your car or truck regardless of maker model, and they're going to have it for a better price. These big box stores, you're going to pay 30%, 50%, 100% more. They charge different prices for professionals and do-it-yourselfers. Save yourself that at Rock Auto, which charges everybody the same. It's a family business serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years. Their prices are reliably low for every customer. And they got all the parts you need from brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, and even new carpet. Go explore. They're easy to use website today to find the solution for your auto parts needs. Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. Right locked on in the How'd You Hear Bass box so they know we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need at rockauto.com. We'll be right back on Locked On NBA. 
Final segment here with David Ramil on Locked On NBA. I'm Matt Moore. Thanks for joining us and making us your first listen each and every day. If you enjoy our commentary, you can catch me on Locked On Nuggets and David on Locked On Heat. Speaking of the Heat, the <laughs> one seed Miami Heat are awaiting their opponent. They will face. I always love how this this gets phrased, David. The winner of the <laughs> of the nine ten versus the loser of the seven eight. The winner of the winner versus the loser, and that's who the Heat will get. Um, I'll ask you this. Let's assume the Nets win, because we both think the Nets are going to win. Three very flawed teams. No Gordon Hayward for the for the Charlotte Hornets. Probably no John Collins for the Atlanta Hawks. Maybe no Jared Allen for the Cleveland Cavaliers. Pretty... Pretty, as long as the Nets don't lose that game on Tuesday, the Heat are sitting pretty, I think, in their spot. Uh, before I ask you the question about Bam, of the three, what is the be- they're all good matchups for Miami. Of the yeah. three, what's the best matchup for Miami? What what are Heat fans hoping for out of those three? I think it's the Hornets. Uh, in a, a recent game, uh, Miami scored their their. I think their second highest scoring total in franchise history against this Hornets team at full strength without Hayward, of course. So I think they kind of, uh, I, I, I think they could have their way offensively with Charlotte. Uh, defensively, they, I'm sure they could probably keep up with Charlotte's uh, younger, quicker players. I mean, on paper, they might provide some kind of a mismatch there, but I like Miami's chances. So it's definitely the Hornets. I'd say the Cavaliers are probably the uh, opponent they'd like to face the least because of the length and the the mismatches that uh, Allen, again, if he's available, provides there. But uh, if he's not available, again, I, I think it's I think Miami would be okay facing any of those three teams, but I think Charlotte is the easiest for them to continue to advance in the playoffs. All right, so Bam Adebayo pops up yesterday, yeah. just like uh, Gor- Goran Dragic was was on the, <laughs> the list for the, for the Nets, uh, and then he's off. Now, I don't know if those two play or not. Uh, Bam popped up yesterday on the COVID list, health and safety protocols. Is this expected to be... Is there any details? Do we think he's symptomatic? The fact that the NBA is really pulled back on the old testing makes me a little bit nervous that Bam might, might his availability might be compromised for the game starting next Sunday. Yeah. Uh, uh, look, Eric Spolstra uh, just uh, tested positive too as the team was traveling to Toronto, and I'm sure that a big part of that was probably the uh, the increased testing in order to cross the national border there. Uh, Spo eventually has cleared the safety protocols. And the expectation is that Bam would be cleared by, I believe, the 14th. Uh, so that would be uh, what was Thursday. Uh, and if that's the case, Miami probably wouldn't face any opponent until Sunday. So they have plenty of time to continue to incorporate him. He can continue to get some work in. He can get some practice in with the team. And look, this is Bam we're talking about. He's familiar enough with what Miami does. I don't think it's any issue sure. in terms of of his being able to reintegrate himself to the team or anything. It's not like they're going to incorporate any new wrinkle if they have to face the Hornets, Cavs, or Hawks. So I'm sure that it's okay. So right now, plenty of optimism. It just kind of felt odd because, again, with the last game of the season and the team just kind of resting half their roster anyway because they were facing the Orlando Magic, uh, you know, a 40-point game from Victor Oladipo, something Heat fans want to point out as – Clearly, Oladipo should be the number one option on this Heat team, but not realistic also. Uh, Bam, I don't, I'm not concerned about it. I don't think the team is either. That's good to hear. Uh, <laughs> on the other side of the Heat's bracket, you've got the four-seed Philadelphia 76ers taking on the five-seed Toronto Raptors. This is going to be the trendy upset pick. This this is the one I can already see it. Like there's already like everyone being like, ooh, I think the Raptors can beat the Sixers. I kind of think people are going a little too far. The Raptors have been playing very good basketball over the last month. And this team, like, look, I, I full disclosure, I always underestimate this Raptors team. Just like that's my thing. Yeah. I am on underestimate the Raptors corner. Um, so like, will they make it tough? Yes. Am I looking for opportunities to bet things like the Raptors to keep it close. Yeah, I'm looking at that. Uh, they're still going to roll out Kem Birch, Chris Boucher, and Precious Achua as their three centers versus right. the most dominant scoring center in the last 20 years. Like, 
I don't know what they're going to do. Now they'll, they'll throw a bunch of different looks at him because nurse is a great coach, right? The coach, the coaching edge here is massive, right? Doc's got a lot of success. Nick nurse is better schematically for, for scheming stuff. Nick nurse is a lot better. The non MB minutes have been a disaster. So they're going to have to limit that. And MB does get gassed if he has to play heavy minutes over and over and over again. Like there's a lot of ways. I think this goes sideways. The Raptors are 25th in half court offense. They're 25th in half court offense per possession. I just don't know how they're going to score enough. Even if Harden struggles, and even if they double team Embiid, you still got Tyrese Maxey, and you got Tobias Harris shooting 37% since the All Star break. David, I I feel like people are going a little too far. Getting, a, I feel like this is the the very trendy upset pick that does not work out. That's where I'm at right now. I may change my mind by Friday, but that's where I'm at with Toronto. I, I, feel, I feel the same way, and, and I've underestimated Toronto, which is why I have such a hard time consciously going into it and saying that they have no chance. Like I, I, again, I feel like when you have the MVP or a MVP candidate in Embiid, and you've got Harden on this team, and who knows what you're getting out of Maxi and and Harris and everybody else, I just they're clearly the the better team, but somehow. Toronto just finds a way to pull things together. And I feel like Siakam has just been one of those guys who's been so under the radar this season. And he's been really, 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 really good for Toronto. And nobody really wants to talk about him because it's Pascal Siakam. And who cares, right? Because it's the Raptors. And and nobody really cares about that team anyway. They're plucky, as you said. And so you kind of overlook the fact that they've got some really strong performances from a lot of great players on this team. Uh, I I don't know. The the, the matchup opportunities to go up against Embiid, and they've done a good job of limiting Embiid in the past, so you kind of wonder whether or not they might not necessarily have his number, but they might challenge him, maybe get him into foul trouble, maybe just keep him out of his comfort zone, which is a pretty wide zone to keep out of. And yet Toronto has done a pretty good job of that. Uh, Having said that, it's... I kind of feel like it's a seven game series waiting to happen. And if that's the case, who knows what pulls, who knows what Nick nurse will pull out for a, a you know, a season saving game seven. Uh, I don't know. I don't know, Matt. It's a great series. It's a great series. It's going to be a lot of fun to watch. And I'm just curious to see how it all plays out. And that's the whole thing about the playoffs, right? Like we, we, we formulate all these opinions over the course of 82 games and so many months and everything else. And yet somehow we always wind up going, Holy crap, I yeah. did not see that coming. Somehow there's a box in one waiting out there, and, and who knows what's going to happen, and it's going to change the course of the NBA season. So that's what the playoffs is all about. I love that. There's a box in one waiting out there somewhere. Uh, <laughs> meanwhile, in a series that I, I on the other end of it, uh, the the Milwaukee Bucks very wisely decided to tank their game versus the Cavs. They get the Chicago Bulls in the 3-6 mm. matchup. This Bulls team has been just – absolutely falling apart this is i will say this this one seems so obvious david that this is the one where i'm like are, is this the one we're not seeing are the bulls right. going to go in and win game one just because it makes the least sense of all of the series right. uh but that's my only real belief like that's the only reason i have that the bulls are going to be able to compete here uh look the the bucks like to run drop coverage which should give zach levine and demar de room to eat in the mid-range Right. Problem is the Bucks are really good at running it. Like they're just really they proved last year you can run drop if you're just awesome at doing it. Uh, the Bulls, I don't think are gonna be able to get stops. The Bucks, I think, are. The Bucks are gonna run the ball constantly. The Bulls uh transition offense is really good, but the Bucks are very disciplined. I have a hard time believing the Bulls are gonna be able to put up much of a fight here. It sucks. They were a really fun team. Feels like they run out of gas and the Lonzo ball injury just kind of sunk them. Yeah, if there's an X factor for me, like it's kind of crazy to say this out loud, it's Nikola Vucevic. Like mm-hmm. uh, as a floor spacer, a guy who kind of takes Brook Lopez out of the paint. I mean, they'd have to go small with Bobby Portis, which obviously Milwaukee has done uh, throughout the course of the season while Lopez was rehabbing. I think between Vucevic's shooting, if he if he's knocking down shots, and if he can continue to pepper the offense with a couple of well-timed passes here and there to a cutter or even to somebody out in the perimeter. Maybe they can steal a game or two, but even then, I just, it just doesn't seem realistic that they can knock off the NBA champs at this point. In the West, Golden State Warriors taking on a very, very tired Denver Nuggets team. Uh, probably, <laughs> probably no Jamal Murray for them. Yeah. Uh, MPJ, I would say, is a definite no. Uh, I'll ask you this: This is, instead of look, I think we both kind of think the Warriors are going to win. Uh, I'll ask you this question: Who's the best player in the series in Warriors Nuggets? best uh it's still the joker uh but i think 
you know, Curry, uh, the variance for what he can do is just un- unmatchable. So I, yeah. I think he certainly has an argument there, but I think it's still Jokic. The Warriors are much better equipped to guard Nikola Jokic than the Nuggets are to guard Steph Curry. I'll say that. Um, <laughs> Good point. Yeah. Th- it, what's funny is, you know, the Nuggets are bad at the point of attack on defense. And so some of the coverage in terms of, like Curry doesn't, doesn't generate the switch that he wants and then attack it. Like he doesn't target mismatches the way that Chris Paul does. That's not what he does. Um, but the problem is, to. Be, yeah, he doesn't have to. The problem is just going to be the only guy on that team that can even remotely hang with him is Austin Rivers. That's the only guy that can remotely hang with him off screens. That's the only guy that has a defensive capability. They just don't, they don't have a Mikhail Bridges. They don't have a Marcus Smart. They don't have any of those guys. And offensively, they don't have the weapons either. This Warriors offense is honestly pretty middling. Yeah. Probably just like the Nuggets without Jamal Murray and MPJ. Their second best player is Aaron Gordon. Their third best player is probably Monte Morris. Mm -hmm. And their fourth best player with the way Will Barton has played is probably rookie Bones Highland. They just don't have the weapons. If the Nuggets pull off this upset, it'll be another testament to Jokic's greatness. But uh, I'm not expecting much from this first round series, given where the Nuggets are at after a really rough three years, exhaustion and injury wise. Uh, And finally, let's talk about the four seed versus the five seed. Um, The Utah Jazz taking on the Dallas Mavericks. This was going to be like a whole like crowning of the Mavericks. And then Jason Kidd played Luka Doncic with a huge lead on Sunday night. And Doncic suffers a calf strain. No, as we're recording this on Monday afternoon, there's no results of that. Yeah, there's no results of the MRI. We don't know how bad the injury is. I'll say this. Once they get those, they may hide it because they may do the whole like Oops. gamesmanship thing with you don't know if he's going to play it, which is dumb because the Jazz are like, we, we're we going to prep if he's going to play. And if he doesn't, we can we- celebrate yeah <laughs> yeah we, we can prep either way like we can practice for for both outcomes uh we'll be prepared if, if luca does play to the degree that you can be let's let's assume that it's not so bad let's say that luca is back at least by game two um the matchup here is really interesting hmm. i don't know I'm a little bit, I've been very much like, Hey, I think the Mavericks are actually going to make a run. If they got into the three seed, I would be betting the Mavericks to make the Western, like to make the finals just because of the number would be so good. I'm a little bit worried about this matchup just for a number of reasons. What are your thoughts on it? I, I predicted the jazz as the title favorite earlier in the year. So oh my. Uh, yeah, I, that, and that worked out the way that I, I thought it would. I, I thought they were tying everything together. I mean, obviously they've had some issues with injury and, uh, Chemistry hasn't always been great. Uh, having said all that, I just, uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I think, I mean, maybe not much of an X factor, but in a pretty obvious thing. But, you know, Mitchell, we've seen him have incredible performances in the playoffs. And if he can take advantage of a, 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 a you know, a team that's with without their best player in Dallas, uh, I, I think we'll see him start to dominate once again. And that being the case, Utah has a pretty good chance of being able to move past this Mavericks team. Like this is a really, really good matchup uh, on paper. And I, I think it's a, I, I don't have a favorite out of this, but I, I'd say that Utah can, can knock off the Mavs. I think they can do it. Do you think that there's a chance that the Jazz can knock off the Mavs? Here's the problem. Looking? Every, every time that I'm like, you know, this might actually be like a really good spot for the Jazz. That makes me nervous because it seems like the Jazz screw up the most in the good spots. But this is the whole thing. It's like, you have a Maverick, you have a very favorable Utah, but they've just been imploding slowly over the last year. They don't seem like they trust each other at all. They're pointing fingers. There's a lot of information about potential offseason trades. I don't know how they're like, I don't know if they can keep this together, especially if Luca comes back and is targeting them. There was a game in, I believe, in, I had the bet stream for it. I did a league pass broadcast on it. And Rudy shut Luca down on late game switches. Luca likes to target the tough matchup on the court. And go after it because he's a lunatic. Right. I don't know if that's actually the play here. Like, I don't know that that's like the way that you should go at the end of the series. He figures it out. It's an interesting coaching matchup. It's an interesting, like, Donovan Mitchell's been terrible in the clutch. This is a yeah. messy series. And, and I'm going to need a couple more days, I think, to figure out where I'm at on it. Let's go wrap it up. NBA, thanks for joining us, everybody. Have yourselves a great week. We'll be back tomorrow with the crew for Tuesday or Wednesday's show. Enjoy the play-in games. We'll talk to you guys again next week. For David Ramil, I'm Matt Moore. Thanks for joining us on Locked On NBA.